now call to order the Society's 2365th meeting and 145th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific inquiry and understanding. Welcome to our guests and members to tonight's lecture by Kit Craig Kundra. We'll begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2364th meeting and a brief recounting of the 27th meeting of the Society in 1872. We then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the fall 2016 and spring 2017 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who asked to remain anonymous. I'm sad to announce that longtime PSW member Catherine Gebby has passed away. Catherine was a public servant of seemingly infinite grace and insight. She long, was long a gently commanding president at NIST, where in a short 15-year period she hired and nurtured four Nobel Prize winners. Her many contributions to science and the public were so significant that a building at NIST is named for her. For 21 years, from 1991 to 2012, Catherine directed NIST's physics and then physical measurement laboratory, overseeing the work of more than 1,000 people at facilities in Gaithersburg and Boulder, Colorado, and their work in establishing methods and standards for fundamental and for practical things, such as time, temperature, radiation. Catherine was the staunchest supporter of investigator-driven research. As she herself put it, part of my job was just showing how whatever they, the scientists, wanted to do would fit into the mission of NIST. And she described her management technique as, quote, plant them, give them the resources they need, and let them run. Bill Phillips, the Nobel Prize winner, said that Gebby shielded her, science, her scientists from paperwork and bureaucratic obstacles, keeping them free of these burdens to pursue the scientific work they were hired to do. Her techniques worked. Not only did four of her scientists win Nobel Prizes, but also many of them stayed at NIST long after their accomplishments were recognized, turning down far more lucrative positions to stay there and pursue the science in the nearly ideal atmosphere for it that Catherine Gebby provided. She was, however, a thoroughly independent individual. In her youth, she toured the world on her own. She became a pilot and took up mountaineering, avocations that she avidly pursued well into her later life. She was a longtime member of PSW and contributed to the organization in many ways, not least by her help in identifying and recruiting speakers to PSW on the most timely and interesting topics in material science and physics. She also was a personal friend to many, many PSW members, and we will all miss her. She was 84 years old, and she died this summer on August 17th. So, turning to a more cheerful note, I'm pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Omar Uden, an entrepreneur and consultant with U Vision Consulting. George Brenn, a cardiologist and volunteer faculty member of cardiology at George Washington University, and Craig Kundrat, tonight's speaker. As a special gift for new members, I have copies of the first volume of the PSW Bulletin, which I'm sure will do good service on their night tables. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. The minutes of the previous meeting's lecture on Bitcoin and the blockchain will now be read by External Communications Director, Preston Thomas. Thank you. 
At the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., September 9th, 2016, President Larry Milstein called the 2,364th meeting of the Society to order at 8.10 p.m. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The minutes of the previous meeting were read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Arvind Narayanan, Assistant Professor of Computer Science and leader of the Web Transparency and Accountability Project at Princeton University, and an affiliated scholar at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford University. His lecture was titled, Bitcoin and the Blockchain. Dr. Narayanan began by explaining the origins of cryptocurrencies. He presented the Caesar cipher, a trivial substitution cipher, and the Visionaire cipher, which introduced the use of a shifting alphabetic cipher based on a secret key. This proved indecipherable for several centuries, up through the Civil War, but was eventually rendered obsolete by the late 1800s. In the 1970s, computing techniques were applied to cryptography and the first modern encryption began to appear. In 1976, Whit Diffie and Marty Hellman published a key exchange method, which provided mathematical proof that it is possible to securely transmit data over an insecure channel without relying on a prior shared private key. This asymmetric key encryption was extended in a 1978 paper by Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman, who showed that keys could be used for digital signatures that would provide mathematically verifiable proof of identity. Dr. Narayan explained that computer-based encryption techniques broke the cat and mouse game of encryption and cryptanalysis, providing a decisive advantage to encryption. Quantum computing may one day disrupt the status quo if it becomes feasible, but quantum-resistant encryption can be operated on standard computers, and early versions have in fact already been made available in modern web browsers. For the foreseeable future, the arms race has been fundamentally tilted in favor of the code makers. The strength of encryption provoked a response from the US government, which attempted to prevent strong cryptography from becoming widely available. This effort, which became known as the first crypto war, ultimately failed by the early 2000s, in large part because the underlying equations were so simple to implement and to share. Dr. Narayanan explained that the, the developers of modern cryptography perceived an explicit political dimension to their work, designing systems that would combat the increasing reach of computerized government surveillance. Bitcoin is one concrete artifact of this vision of private, decentralized, ungoverned systems. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer system. Bitcoin transactions are signed with the private key of the user, then broadcast to the entire Bitcoin network. Each transaction consists of the address of the sender and receiver, the value sent, and the sender's signature. The goal of the protocol is to record every transaction in a global, immutable public ledger known as the blockchain. The blocks in the blockchain are simply collections of transactions processed together for efficiency. Each block added to the, to the chain includes a cryptographic digest of the previous block to ensure that no block can be changed once it is entered. Inevitable disagreements about the current state of the blockchain are resolved through a voting mechanism by all of the computers tracking the blockchain. But voting power is proportional to the processing power of each computer. The computers that agree with the ultimate consensus are rewarded in Bitcoin proportional to the computing power they contributed to resolving the discrepancy. Thus, Bitcoin mining incentivizes the largest and fastest computers to participate in keeping the blockchain up to date. Computers demonstrate their processing power to the network by completing computationally hard problems as proof of work. Currently, there are about a trillion, trillion operations performed for each block, and a new block is added every 10 minutes. The anonymity of, block, of Bitcoin naturally lends itself to illegal activity, such as the online marketplace Silk Road. But Bitcoins are also usable for addressing a host of morally legitimate problems, such as reducing transaction costs and sending international payments. Dr. Narayanan concluded by explaining that the underlying technology of modern cryptography is sound and powerful, enough so to provide a trusted basis on which to improve and augment our existing legal, social, and political institutions. After the conclusion of the talk, President Milstein invited questions from the audience. One questioner asked whether a government could destroy Bitcoin by applying sufficient computing power to seize control of the blockchain. While theoretically possible, Dr. Narayan explained that this would be impractical and prohibitively expensive, 
out of proportion of the threat that Bitcoin might propose to such a go government. Another questioner asked about the nature of the puzzle that miners solve to incorporate a new block into the chain. Dr. Narayanan explained that the task involves hashing random numbers to the existing blockchain to see if they produce an output hash that satisfies the properties specified in the Bitcoin protocol. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.43 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,364th meeting of the society to the social hour. Temperature, 29C. Weather, partly cloudy. Attendance, 90. Respectfully submitted, Preston Thomas, External Communications Director. Thank you, Preston. Are there any corrections to the minutes or comments on them? If not, I'll entertain a motion from a member to accept the minutes as read. Second? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? I'll consider that, that unanimously approved and will be posted to the website in due course. The 27th meeting of the Society was held on Saturday, May 18, 1872. Neither the time nor the location of the meeting is reported in the bulletin. W.B. Taylor was in the chair, standing in for then-President Joseph Henry, who apparently was not attending. <clears throat> Taylor was the first, fourth president of the society. He served for one year in 1882. As noted in an earlier presentation, at the 20th meeting of the society, he made a preliminary report on the Aurora Borealis, and then at the 21st meeting followed that report up. I don't have any further information on him. Anyone who knows more about him is welcome to inform me. And the illustrations of the Aurora Borealis here clearly are modern, some of them being <laughs> taken by satellite. Mr. G.K. Gilbert gave a report on his recent geographical and geological researchers, researches in Arizona and Nevada. Gilbert is considered one of the giants of geomorphology, he made fundamental contributions to the understanding of landscape evolution, erosion, river incision, and sedimentation. He also was a pioneer of planetary science. He carried out early impact cratering experiments that led him to conclude, correctly, that lunar craters were caused by impacts. He was also one of 33 original founders of the National Geographic Society, a group that includes several other PSW members. Dr. Van Sant of San Francisco made a presentation on electrical spark triggering devices, including a demonstration. I don't have any further information on this speaker, not even a picture, but I'm sure the demo was electrifying. <laughs> and William Harkness read a letter from a Captain Tupman of the British Navy reporting observations of a recent solar eclipse the captain had observed while in India. As noted in earlier presentations here, Harkness served in the Civil War, in part on the Monadnock Iron Boat, and eventually reached the rank of Rear Admiral in the United States Navy. He served as Director of the Naval Observatory for many years, and as President of PSW in 1887, and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1893. He invented a variety of astronomical instruments, developed a theory of achromatic lenses, and participated in two expeditions to observe transits of Venus, which played a very important role in early calculations of the size of the solar system. He never married, and believe it or not, he lived his entire productive life at the Cosmos Club. <laughs> his presentations at previous meetings of the Society included a paper on the corona of the sun, here pictured with modern equipment, the results of his investigations of the spectrum of Encke's comet, which is still an object of considerable interest and study, and his observations on the appearance of Tuttle's comet. From the 27th meeting of the Society in 1872, we turn to the 2365th meeting and to tonight's lecture on NASA's Kelly Twins study. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Craig Kundrat. Craig is the life sciences lead in the office of the chief scientist at NASA, where he coordinates life science research in astrobiology, human research, 
planetary protection, and space biology, both within NASA and between NASA and other organizations. Before joining NASA, Craig was an X-ray crystallographer and worked on protein and RNA structure function relationships. At Yale, the Medical Research Council Laboratory for Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, and the University of Colorado. He continued this work at NASA and then assumed science management positions for biotechnology and material science. He served as deputy chief scientist for NASA's human research program and as the first mission scientist for the human research program's twins study. He also served as chair of the Institutional Review Board at the Johnson Space Flight Center that formulates NASA's genetic research policy for astronauts. During his NASA career, Craig has been awarded three center director commendations and six special service awards. He earned a BA in integrated science with a minor in biochemistry at Northwestern and an MPhil and a PhD in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. Please hold questions for the, quest, <clears throat> for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Craig to the podium. See if we can find you. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Thank you, President Milstein. <laughs> and thank you, Society, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you tonight. So let's start off with a little context uh, for the twin study. The long-term goal is the planet Mars. It hasn't always been that way at NASA, but it has been for about the last dozen years. There has been very broad agreement in the Congress and the executive branch, and equally importantly, amongst our international partners, that Mars is what we call the horizon destination meaning it's a destination that's out there on the horizon. It's not imminent, but it's not, you know, over the horizon and we know not what. It's, it's out there, it's on the, on the periphery. We're not going there straight away. It's going to be a couple decades. Um, and therefore, we have to gird ourselves for the journey to Mars, is what we call it these days. <clears throat> so in roughly the 2030s, we, for, we, we hope to be in the Mars vicinity. But first, in preparation for that, we have a lot of work to do on good old terra firma, planet Earth. And right now, our space operations are focused on the International Space Station, where crews typically spend a six-month rotation uh, on the station before coming down. In the near future, we hope to be in the vicinity of the moon with our new space capsule, the Orion vehicle, in what we call cislunar space. And we also have on the books, and in being planned right now, the asteroid redirect mission, which will bring part of an asteroid to the vicinity of the moon for further research uh, by uh, human crew. This is all in preparation for learning the skills we need for long duration operations in deep space, you know, far from Earth where you cannot get back quickly. The first destination that we may go to are the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. And of course, eventually, the, the grand prize is human exploration of the surface of Mars. So right now, we're using the International Space Station to learn a lot about human physiology, psychology, et cetera, to understand how the human responds to spaceflight. So I got to say, NASA is an engineering organization. Okay? It's not the National Institutes of Health. So we use language like the human system. You know, just another system in the spacecraft like avionics, uh, thermal control, propulsion, structures, things like that. And from our vantage point, from that perspective, we want to understand how the human system is responding to the challenges of spaceflight. And we're doing a lot of that right now on the International Space Station. So to give you a little bit firmer idea of what we have in mind for a mission to Mars, this is not a binding concept, but it's one of the most mature that we have. 
The idea would be this is an expensive undertaking, so we'd probably undertake not just one mission, but it'd be a campaign in what we call Design Reference Architecture 5. It would be three missions spread out over the course of a decade with a crew of six. Okay, that number could go, probably won't go up, but it could go down. But nominally, we're thinking of a crew of six people. And then there are a couple of different trajectories one might take. And the, most, the one that gets the most attention, the most consideration, is called a conjunction class mission, which is the long stay version on Mars. So it would make for about a 30-month mission. It would be a six-month transit to Mars, an 18-month stay on the surface, and a six-month transit back to Earth. Now, the reason for this, this long duration has to do with orbital mechanics, which we won't be doing a lecture on tonight. But, but the basic idea is um, to, to have a low energy uh, approach to Mars, um, you have to launch at a time where when you get to the Mars orbit phase, Mars will actually be there. Okay? It's not, it wouldn't be a good thing to take your low energy trajectory and then find there's nothing there. That, that opportunity only occurs about every two years or so. Okay, now, you could, if you just want to stay for a couple of weeks and you came back, well, you'd have a problem on the return leg because when you got to the Earth orbit, Earth wouldn't be there, okay? So you got to wait, as it turns out, 18 months before you leave and then take that low energy trajectory back to Earth, okay? And so that gives you the six month transits on either side and 18 months um, on the surface. Now, if we had more advanced propulsion, uh, we might be able to consider changes to this scenario. But basically, in, in the rocket business, in exploration, everything boils down to mass. It, the, the price, both in terms of the fuel, the technology, and the dollars, goes literally exponentially up with the mass of the system. And so that's why there's such a premium on reducing the mass, the volume, the power of spacecraft, and also taking these low energy trajectories. Because to take a higher energy trajectory means you've got to take up more fuel and it's you know, more costly, et cetera. So this is the framework to have in mind that we eventually want to do. It'd be a, a mission to Mars is going to take a couple years, you know, transit, and, um, and stay on, on the surface. And we'll hear more about the properties of the, of the mission in a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go back to this human system now. And what does spaceflight do to the human system? I'm going to share with you the, the top three things. And I'm going to use the language of stimulus and response, okay? So the first and most obvious thing about spaceflight that, most, that occurs to most people is weightlessness, all right? But there's actually other accelerations involved as well. So in, in launching right now, um, we go up to the International Space Station on the Russian uh, Soyuz rocket. So you start off in your comfortable 1G environment here on Earth, and your launch acceleration is 3G. Okay, which is not so bad. It's not a, um, it's not a great strain. Um, most people can do it. And so space tourism will probably uh, have a very broad uh, and large clientele. Uh, then you get up into zero G, um, which is not literally zero G. So in low Earth orbit, the strength of gravity is actually about 95% of what it is right here on Earth. But in the spacecraft, you're in a state of continuous free fall. So as far as you're concerned in the spacecraft, you're weightless. It's like falling down or falling in a, an infinitely long or high elevator. You're weightless in that uh, environment. Now, importantly, three fundamental things occur um, when you're in microgravity or, or weightlessness. First is sedimentation. When you let go of, a, of an object, it doesn't fall. It just floats, okay? There are some very interesting stories about the astronauts adapting to these kinds of things. So like, for example, when, they're, when a rookie astronaut goes up and they're tossing something to a, to a colleague, their brains are used to building in an arc you know, for, that, for that object, okay? Well, there isn't any gravity pulling it down, so they're just you know, hitting the ceiling with stuff they throw. <laughs> Similarly, when they come back, you know, I, I've heard Astronauts say, yeah, I just, like, you know, they, they have an object, they just let go of it, you know, because they're going to attend to something else. And, of course, gravity comes to the rescue. Okay, so, so the first effect is you don't have sedimentation. Another is you don't have convection, 
um, buoyancy-driven convection. Um, so that means, like in this room right now, uh, you know, we all heat up the air around us a little bit. That that hot air rises, cooler air comes along in uh, beside you. On the space station, that doesn't happen. You know, if you if you don't have fans purposely uh, venting the air over an area, uh, things just heat up there. And so it makes combustion, for example, a very interesting phenomenon. Instead of a flame, which um, gets its oxygen from the air that is, is brought in from the sides as the thermal plume, plume goes up, um, you get instead a little um, ignited sphere. Um, it's a sphere of, it looks like a, a, a gas, uh, a little sphere of, that moves around in the gaseous compartment. It's a little flame ball. Um, so fire is entirely different. The movie Gravity actually did a good job of depicting that when they, they showed a space, uh, fire on space station. You also don't have hydrostatic pressure, which is going to be very important for our physiology. As I'm standing here right now, and even you sitting there right now, your cardiovascular system is battling gravity, you know, keeping from the blood from pooling in your feet and making sure that you have enough blood flow to, to listen to or deliver this uh, lecture. And then lastly, there are body forces, which are in a way really um, just sedimentation writ large. But um, <clears throat> as an example, uh, on the space station, we have our astronauts exercising on treadmills, okay? If you didn't do anything special, we could all run a marathon on an ISS treadmill because we'd be weightless. So you just got to move your legs for a couple hours and say you did a marathon. Um, so what you have to do for the treadmill is actually pull them down with bungee cord uh, type apparatus to, to give a sense of body weight. So you don't have um, body forces, which is really just kind of a subset of sedimentation. So these are the fundamental things that change when you don't have um, gravity tugging on you, when you're weightless. Now, when we're talking about Mars, when we're on the surface, the, the strength of gravity on the Martian surface is three-eighths what we have here. And the effect of that on our physiology is a real big unknown. Okay? Of course, most of our medical data is about human physiology in 1G. Now, especially with station and these six-month missions that we've been doing, we've done 48 um, so far, uh, we're acquiring a lot of knowledge about what happens in weightlessness for extended periods of time. But we have no idea about what's going to happen at 3 8 G. Will that be more like 1G or 0G? We don't know. And it probably depends on which physiological system you're talking about. When it comes time to, to return to Earth, this is a picture of a Soyuz return, um, you go from your weightless environment to typically a 5G reentry profile uh, until you're back on, on the surface. Um, if things go a little awry on a Soyuz return, it has a fail-safe mode, which is called a ballistic entry. And that doesn't sound good, right? Um, <laughs> that gives you eight or nine Gs for on the order of a minute. Um, and so that's quite a stressor. It's survivable, but it's, it, it's very taxing. So acceleration is the number one big change uh, in spaceflight. And it's not just weightlessness. You have those launch loads and the landing loads. OK, the second biggest stimulus, or the second on our list, is radiation. So on Earth, with your medical diagnoses, you know, your dental x-rays, uh, with therapeutics, um, like radiation therapy for cancer, we're talking about almost exclusively photons, you know, x-rays and gamma rays. Um, you know, a form of light for that kind of radiation. <clears throat> but in space, we encounter other types of radiation. So first are solar particle events. These are, um, as you might imagine, come from the sun. Um, they're episodic. They go with the solar cycle. Um, the bad news is we can't really predict when they're going to occur. Um, the good news is we can shield. Um, the spacecraft and, and the crew in the spacecraft from large solar uh, flare events. Um, they're mostly protons uh, with a bit of helium, okay? <clears throat> the other form are called galactic cosmic rays. Uh, and I didn't make up this term. My wife thinks that this is, you know, sounds like a science fiction kind of term, but this is the actual term, galactic cosmic rays. They are basically the nuclei of atoms ranging from simple hydrogen and its proton up to iron in the periodic table, which has a, uh, an atomic number of 26. 
okay? Nuclei of these atoms moving at fractions of the speed of light. And they're not coming from one particular direction, they're omnidirectional, they're coming from every direction. Um, they vary in intensity, it's a low level, uh, uh, but it varies by a factor of two opposite the solar cycle. So when our sun is active and spewing out a lot of material, it tends to tamp down the amount of GCR by a factor of two compared to when the sun is relatively quiescent. Um, only 1% of the galactic cosmic rays are these heavy nuclei, like iron, um, but those particles carry a lot, a lot of energy. So when it comes to the amount of energy deposited in human tissue, those heavy ions are responsible for a large part of the dose. Bad news is, shielding is difficult. In fact, a little bit of shielding can actually make matters worse because as these particles traverse matter, they occasionally hit a nucleus, collide, and fragment. And now you've got multiple particles passing through matter. Um, the dose rate is about a milligray a day. Um, so that's about a chest x-ray every 10 days or so. Um, so it's not a real high dose, but we can't shield it, and it's constant throughout the, the whole mission. Okay, the third and the last of our big three uh, challenges in spaceflight, or stimuli, is actually psychological. Um, isolated, confined, extreme environments. So the first aspect of concern is the monotony that can be experienced uh, in an environment like a spacecraft. So you have both social and environmental monotony. And we know this really well from our, our colleagues at the NSF who do uh, these winter overs in Antarctica. Uh, we actually have some people at NASA who have done those, and one of which was a, actually the medical officer on, on two of those uh, missions. And what he reports is, at the beginning of, of the winter over period where you have about 15 crew, everyone's gathered together for dinner, you know, they're sharing their stories, they're joking around, etc. But by the end of the winter, it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Larry. I've heard you're a funny guy, but I've heard your stories, you know, <laughs> way too many times. I'm just grabbing my meal and going back to my room. You know, so by the end of the, the nine-month winter over period, you know, the, the social structure is just kind of like dissolved in that, in that sense. Um, and, you know, mentally, they've slowed down a lot. They can still do their tasks, but it takes them a lot more time. And it's really apparent when the relief crews come in, you know, to the, to the winter over folks, it's like the, the relief folks are working at, you know, at warp speed in, in comparison. Now, our astronauts don't really have that slowdown uh, effect, but when we think about the Mars mission, you know, going from a six-month, you know, in the vicinity of the Earth uh, mission to a 30-month you know, trip out and back, uh, we don't know. And, and, and certainly the social monotony is going to be a factor when you only have, say, five other crew members uh, to spend that whole time with. So that's a concern, the psychological uh, impact of that. The crew is also going to be uh, physically and communication-wise very remote from Earth. The communication transit time, one way, can be 20 minutes uh, when the planets are on opposite you know, sides of the sun or close to it. Um, so if you think that annoying delay you sometimes get with your cell phone is bad, you know, <laughs> try talking to your spouse you know, with a 20 minute delay. Uh, <laughs> I guess the good thing is you can't have too many arguments. Uh, like, um, <clears throat> uh, sleep and circadian disruption, okay? So we're, so used to our, you know, night and day cues. Our space station uh, folks, they have a challenge because they're, they're going around the planet, you know, every 90 minutes, you know, so they're getting a sunrise and sunset, you know, something's happening every 45 minutes. And, and so they're, they're thrown off that way. When you go take a deep, spe deep space mission, you're not going to have any cues like that. And we've done experiments uh, in concert well, actually, the, down here, I won't go over the details, but we've, uh, some experiments have been done by the Russians where they put people in an isolated chamber uh, for 520 days to simulate a Mars mission. And uh, one of the crew members, from a circadian perspective, was a free runner. You know, basically kind of lost all entrainment and just never really got it back. Whereas another crew member just 
was like a Timex watch, just kept on ticking with that 24-hour uh, periodicity. So there's a lot of individual uh, variability. So we're wondering about how to handle that for the, the, the prolonged deep space mission. It'll be a little different when on the Mars surface because there, the Martian day, known as a Sol, is 24 hours, 40 minutes long. Okay, so it's really sounds pretty close to ours. The, the folks at JPL who have done mission control for the planetary missions on Mars that have worked on the Sol day instead of the Earth day can tell you it's quite a challenge um, to do that. Um, that 40 minute a day slip doesn't sound like a lot, but when you do it for weeks on end or months on end, it's, it's, uh, it, it takes a hit, or it, it, you take a hit. Okay, on the work front, this is a constant battle with, uh, with crew. How to balance the right amount of autonomy you know, for the crew versus direction from mission control. With the International Space Station, the way it was designed, it was designed to have a lot of interaction and support for mission control. So the crew will tell you, generally, that they would like more autonomy, to be able to make more decisions about what they do when. That's going to be a, necessi that'll be a necessity for the Mars mission, because back to that communication delay, you know, when you've got a 20-minute one-way uh, communication, you, know, you can't have mission control orchestrating every, every step. But you can also overdo it and put too much on the crew. So getting the right level of autonomy, the right workload, avoiding fatigue, that's a challenge. And then being away from family uh, and having crew members that are from different cultures um, and organizational, uh, both you know, environmental, national cultures and working cultures will be a challenge because it's a virtual certainty that our forays into deep space will be international efforts. These are going to be um, expensive efforts, and we've already built kind of the foundation of collaboration with the International Space Station. We've got um, five space agencies involving, it was built with 15 countries participating. Uh, it, our future work will be international. So you're going to, if you go on the Mars mission, you'll be with five of your closest friends, picked by your bosses uh, in different countries. So that's another challenge we need to mitigate. Okay, so just in broad strokes, how does the human physiology respond to these, these factors? Primarily the, the weightless one. Um, so here's a notional, and I emphasize that word notional, the, the, the subject matter experts that do this physiology, they have a conniption fit every time we show these kinds of charts because they're cartoons and they're not you know, precise, but they get across the fundamental point. So we're planning the amount of change versus the time after launch. So if you go up to space station, this is what you can look forward to. Immediately when you go up to space station, you're going to have sensory motor issues. Okay? For the first time in your life, except for going off the diving board you know, into the swimming pool for brief moments, um, your inner ear is going to not feel the tug of gravity. The otoliths in your, in your canals are not... Uh, going to be tugged in any particular direction. That's going to be a new kind of sensory input for your brain. You're always used to having gravity pulling from some direction. Okay? So as a result, you may, in the first two, three days, you might join the 70% of your colleagues who experience space motion sickness. Okay? Good news is there are some drugs that can kind of attenuate that and make it less likely that you make a dramatic display of your space motion sickness. <laughs> And after about three days, most people are, have accommodated, okay? They can get along okay. So that, that happens instantly when you're in weightlessness. The next thing that happens uh, is, starting immediately, um, is an upward fluid shift uh, in your body. Because as we were talking about before, right now, we're fighting gravity. Take the gravity away, and your body is just kind of poised to just send fluid up to your, your chest and your head. This is why a lot of times when you see, especially if you're used to looking at the astronauts, when you see their, their early in space pictures, their faces look really puffy. <clears throat> now you have receptors in your, in your body that detect this and say, oh, I've got too much blood volume. Okay? So, 
over the next couple of um, days, so on the order of a week, you shed a liter or two of blood volume, okay? So, okay, that, that's fine. But now, your red blood cell concentration, your hematocrit, has just gone up a good bit. So your body says, all right, we're shutting down the production of red blood cells, all right? And when we were just flying the space shuttle and flying missions of one to two weeks long, we didn't know if that was a long-lasting or a self-limiting effect, you know, of space flight. Now, with our six-month experience, we know that what happens is, um, as the red blood cells are naturally cleared and your hematocrit drops to normal levels, your body resumes the production of, of red blood cells. So it's not a problem, you just accommodate to a new set point, and homeostasis is preserved. So your red blood cell mass, um, uh, you know, initially is, is deviating, but then it, it, it stabilizes. Now the next two curves are kind of misleading in a sense, because what I just said about sensory motor and, and what's happening with blood, that, that, that just happens and that's the natural course and we know how to deal with it. Muscle and bone are things that we actively fight with what we call countermeasures, okay? So if you did not do anything to try and protect against bone loss or muscle loss, you'd probably lose like 2% of your bone mineral density per month, okay? But we never do that. We, it's not ethical to do that experiment. Uh, you know, send an astronaut up, just let them sit there and see if they turn to jelly. Um, <laughs> that, that's not allowed. Um, we do have countermeasures, though, that um, involve exercise and actually seem, we finally got to a point now where we can arrest the bone loss. The muscle strength is a little bit more variable. We have, it varies a lot more between crew members than the bone loss does. Uh, we succeed with some, not as much with others. But it's, it's pretty much under control. They can certainly do their work. Um, then lastly, we have radiation. Um, and that's depicted here as a slow, constant, uh, accumulated amount of damage because that's the, the, the standard accepted model um, these days. There's, that's still an area that's really not really well understood because on Earth, we don't encounter those galactic cosmic rays. Uh, and so this is an area of, of, of great attention by NASA as we need to understand what kind of risk we're putting the astronauts in. But here it's depicted as just a gradual uh, linear increase with mission duration. Now it's time to come back to Earth. You will experience that sensory motor uh, event again. Now you're going the other way. You just enjoyed six months in weightlessness. Now you come back, now your brain's confused. It's, you know, it's like, I thought we got rid of that gravity thing. Now it's back and so now you can be susceptible to a terrestrial form of space motion sickness. Uh, and, and astronauts are not allowed to drive for a couple of weeks uh, because their, their sense of judgment is askew. It's actually, I've never seen it with my own eyes, but I've heard several people report it. It's kind of humor, humorous to watch astronauts walk down the hall, you know, in, in the building when, uh, after their return, like, you know, within the first week or so, and then as they take a corner, because they often, like, clip the corner or things like that, because they just haven't gotten used to those uh, accelerations yet. So we keep them out of the car. <laughs> in green is shown another thing, and this goes back to that plasma volume thing, orthostatic hypotension, that's the tendency to faint, okay? So in space, you shed volume, you know, plasma volume, you reduced your red blood cell count so your concentration was the same. Now when you come back to Earth, guess what? You've got to fight gravity again and you don't have enough blood volume to do that well, okay? So if you don't take special measures, you're, you're prone to fainting. Now happily, this is pretty easily solved with what we call fluid loading, drinking a lot right before return, with salt tablets, wearing compression hose to help uh, squeeze the, the blood volume out of the, the veins and the legs and keep it you know, up high. So that's, that's manageable. But as your blood volume goes up, um, your red blood cell count will start looking low because you just increased the volume but not the number of cells. So it takes a little while to, to replenish your red blood cells. If you have lost muscle, you, know, you can build that back up pretty easily. Bone loss, however, um, can take on the order of years to really recover bone mineral density. Um, so we're very happy about the fact that with the modern exercise protocols, we can really attenuate um, the bone loss. Okay, <clears throat> one last point that doesn't fit in the schema is we're still learning new things about spaceflight. So this is back in 2011 on the International Space Station. 
uh, we'd been doing crewed flights for um, almost a decade, and we started noticing some odd things happening with astronaut vision. So the, in the first seven cases that we had, um, out of 34 astronauts that flew, um, they were all men, and they had a, a broad range of symptoms having to do with the, um, either the eyes or the um, central, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid. So some of them had high intracranial pressure. Um, many of them had, six of them had shifts in their vision to farsightedness. Uh, there were folds in the retina, uh, optic disc edema swelling. You know, these, these are not, these don't sound like good things. Um, Increased optic nerve sheath diameter, cotton wool spots, globe flattening. That's the, the, the globe of the eye actually flattening out a little bit. And this is an area of, under very active investigation right now. The good news is the degree of these symptoms is generally not what you would expect showing up in the clinic. You know, this is sort of uh, because we're examining the astronauts very carefully, we see these kinds of things, but it's sort of really preclinical. However, it's alarming to us because it's completely unexpected. We don't understand what's going on, and we need to get at the root of, root of it because we don't know if this is the type of thing which will get worse and worse as mission duration increases or if it's self-limiting, like that red blood cell story. All right, so we're still learning things, which is one reason why we want to do the twin study. So finally, get to uh, Scott Kelly. Here he is on the cover of Time Magazine on the end of the year issue in 2014. Scott Kelly will spend one year in space. His identical twin will stay on Earth while NASA studies them both. All right, so how did this come to be? Well, back, way back in November of 2012, um, NASA and our Russian colleagues announced something called the one-year mission. Mikhail Kornienko and Scott Kelly would fly on the space station for one year instead of the usual six months. While Scott was being briefed on the kinds of experiments that he would be asked to do uh, along the lines that we were just talking about, you know, physiology and psychology, et cetera, he asked the question, well, what if like in the press brief, you know, the press conferences, someone asked me about, you know, my brother and will there be any studies involving my brother, or, you know, something like that. Well, we hadn't thought about that. And the initial response going back to Scott was, yeah, we're not doing anything. Um, and, and that was because we hadn't thought of it. Also, <laughs> this, the train has already left the station. Um, in November of 2012 is when Scott asked that question. If we were going to do things the normal way for a NASA investigation, we would have, at the beginning of 2012, put out a research solicitation to the broad community asking for proposals. So we were already lost almost a year uh, on this time frame. So sorry, you know, too late. Second reaction was followed very quickly there. It's like, is this going to be a stunt if we did it? You know, this is Evil Knievel. Um, we're talking about a study of one twin pair or, okay, two people. You know, that's, that's hardly your st statistically, you know, well-powered experiment. Uh, but then, then we had some pause. I mean, this is a unique opportunity. And here's a very important trend that's going on in biomedical uh, technology these days. So this is a log linear plot. So on the, on the y-axis here, this is a log plot. So each division is a tenfold change in cost of sequencing your genome. And time is on a linear scale here on the bottom. So back in 2001, it would cost about $100 million to sequence your DNA. When we were having these conversations in November of 2012, you can see the cost had dropped precipitously. And this white line here, this is Moore's Law. That's the, the one we're used to in the computing world and the, in the smartphone world. You know, every 18 months or so, the, you, you get twice as much for your buck. Um, well, when it comes to sequencing the genome, especially with next generation sequencing coming on around 2007, that's been beating the pants off of Moore's Law. So new things were possible, like the following. Here's a study published by Mike Snyder in the journal Cell, which is one of the most reputable, you know, prestigious journals in the biomedical world. He studied one individual and published this seminal paper. Um, that
That individual, by the way, was named Mike Snyder. Okay? He, he did this study on himself. And it's an excellent illustration of the type of things that we hope to learn from the Kelly twins. So we're going to go over just a couple of aspects of, of his study. But before I do that, I'm going to be using the term omics. And just to make sure we're using the term the same way, we're going to just kind of re do a little history and refresh things. So uh, we have our favorite cell here and a nucleus in there. We pull out a chromosome, uh, unravel it, and we have uh, our good friend DNA. From that, uh, our, from our genes, DNA, we transcribe RNA. And we call those molecules transcripts. The RNA is translated into protein. Proteins catalyze most of the reactions, not all, but the vast majority of reactions in our body and control our whole metabolic existence. You know, all our metabolic pathways are, are run by proteins. Now, back in around 1920, the term genome was coined, um, meaning all the genes you know, in the chromosome. And that, that term kind of stood alone until the 1990s when our technology got so good that instead of looking at individual RNA transcripts that you pre-identified which ones you want to look at, you could now look at all the RNA transcripts produced in a cell, or if not all of them, a, a very large quantity. So they needed a term for that large collection, and since the RNA molecules are called transcripts, they called it the transcriptome. At the same time in the 90s, advances in mass spec allowed really broad characterization of the proteins in biological systems. So that was called the proteome, okay? And then for the metabolites, also you can use mass spec and other techniques, that was called the metabolome. Now, going back to, I can't remember when, um, maybe even before the 70s, it was recognized with DNA that the genome actually has changes to it that are not in the DNA sequence, but are on the DNA molecule itself or in the proteins that pack the DNA. Okay? And both of those help regulate whether genes are turned on or off. And because they're not part of the sequencing, the coding part of the genome, they were called the epigenome. Well, turns out for RNA, there are modifications made to it as well, and so that's called the epitranscriptome. Now, if you're going to a cocktail party, do not use the term epiproteome. Okay? So, Logically, it would make sense to have that term. But historically, we knew for a long time that proteins are modified actively as a way of controlling their, their function. So the term epiproteome never came into being because it was sort of overcome by past knowledge. Um, so it's the collection of these things then that we're calling omics. And when I say omics, I'm referring to the genome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and the epigenome and the epitranscriptome. Okay, so back to the Snyder study. This is right from his paper, this artistic rendering of Mike Snyder himself. <laughs> they took peripheral blood mononuclear cells, so that's white blood cells, um, and serum, and did a host of these omics analyses. Uh, and before doing that, they actually sequenced his DNA and looked, at, uh, looked for genetic um, you know, indicators. So, just a real quick background here, there are relatively few mutations that absolutely confer a particular disease outcome. So like Tay-Sachs and cystic fibrosis, there are particular mutations. If an individual has those, they have that condition. Most are correlated with a condition. So like cardiomyopathy, um, the genes involved in that give you about a 50% predictive power. Um, for Alzheimer's, those genes, you know, you're down in the 10% range of having strength of prediction. Well, I did this with Mike, and they, they ran this kind of analysis looking at 20 different maladies are plotted here from the paper. And on a single one out, because it's one they, they emphasized, this is for type 2 diabetes. Um, the triangle here is just knowing that Mike Snyder was uh, a, a white male um, of a certain age, you could look at the population uh, statistics and say he had, I think it was a 28% chance of having type 2 diabetes. When you took his genetic information to an, uh, into account, it went up to 47%, I think. That's shown on the next slide here. We start out with just given his 
um, sex, age, and ethnicity. He's got a 27% probability of having type 2 diabetes. Then all these mutations are taken into account. Some lower the risk, some raise the risk, and eventually ends up uh, with a 46% chance of having diabetes based on this analysis. Now, when he enrolls in the study, he doesn't have diabetes, okay? <clears throat> the study was done for about 400 days. This is a timeline here. All I want to point out is that he had two viral infections during that time. Nothing noteworthy happened with his blood glucose with his first infection, but with his second one, it suddenly spiked from 100, a normal um, concentration, to uh, about 160. And that coincided with the infection. And this is a known phenomenon. The neat thing is they were tracking all these other omics uh, to see what was happening. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Given this, uh, Mike undertook a change in diet exercise and started taking low doses of acetyl salicylic acid and was able to bring it back down to normal levels. Okay, So this is a nice little example of how having your genome, knowing that you might be predisposed to a certain condition, uh, might lead you to be on the lookout for monitoring certain properties. And if they go south, you can intervene early and try and nip it in the bud. They also, uh, there'll be a test on this slide afterwards, um, analyzed the transcriptome of these white blood cells and, and noticed that a lot of genes were being turned on or off with these viral infections. So they had the, the two infections and the same sets were going up and down. Some of them were, were predictable. Um, so T cell receptor signaling, you know, these pathways for immunologists, it's like you'd expect that. But they also, the beauty of transcriptomics is when you're looking at all the transcripts, they found pathways they did not expect to respond and uh, still don't. They have not uh, tracked this down yet. Um, but they found new pathways being activated and deactivated. And that's one of the great powers of these omics technologies is in the old days, you had to be insightful and smart and lucky to know where to look for changes. Now you have like a global technique that allows you to look at like all the RNA and say, oh, what genes are being activated or not? Okay, so in light of that paper, which came out, I don't think I mentioned it, earlier in 2012, one subject published in Cell, we realized, okay, we really have a chance in a lifetime opportunity here with the Kelly twins. <clears throat> so the basic notion is as follows. We have the flight subject, Scott Kelly, we can follow him longitudinally with time and just compare himself with himself. So we can take pre-flight values of some parameter of interest, see if there's a change in flight, see if there's a change when he returns back to Earth. So we can analyze Scott with respect to himself just like Mike Snyder did. We can also compare him to his identical twin, Mark, who's living on the ground during this whole time. Now Mark has what was an astronaut, um, so before this uh, mission, Scott Kelly had flown three times, Mark had flown four times, and Mark had retired from the astronaut corps. Okay? So you can bet uh, how enthusiastic Mark would have been if we would have asked him to eat space food for a year, <laughs> sleep when Scott is sleeping, exercise like Scott is you know, exercising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we did not even deign to ask Mark that question. Instead, we let Mark live a free-range life. Um, and this is kind of the opposite of your normal controlled study where you're really trying to optimize for the most sensitive detection of changes. But if you stop and think about it, this is actually a good experimental design in another regard. Because Mark is free-range, we are seeing in him the natural variations over the course of a year. And so if we see a change in Scott that is a lot larger than that, then that is probably a significant event, okay? Now, it's only one subject, you know, or one pair of subjects. So it's exceedingly unlikely that we will, we will have um, a established conclusion coming out of the twin study. But it's very possible that we'll have intriguing outcomes that we need to follow up with more traditional studies with more subjects. So NASA released a a solicitation with the 
uh, an organization that we funded, the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, to do a pilot demonstration project focused on the use of integrated humic omic analyses to better understand the biomolecular responses to the physical, physiology, and environmental stressors associated with spaceflight. We got a great response from the community, um, some from NASA and, uh, investigators already funded by NASA, others who have never been funded by NASA before. And you know it's a real, it's a real happening thing when e at NASA you either have a TLA for your project, that's a three-letter acronym, uh, or you have a mission patch, okay? And here's the twin study uh, mission patch. Now, <clears throat> we selected 10 investigations to look at a broad range of things, ranging from the molecular to physiology to cognition to the microbiome. Okay? I'm about to take you through a whirlwind tour of those 10 investigations. You will hurt yourself if you try and read the slides. Okay? There's a lot of information there. You can go back and look at the video and, and, and look at them more carefully if you wish. Just I suggest you listen to the narrative. That'll be a lot easier than uh, reading. Okay, and we're going to follow kind of our central dogma that we talked about before, starting with DNA, then RNA, protein metabolites, and then work ourselves up the biological levels of complexity to talk physiology, cognition, and microbiome. Okay, so first off, we have Susan Bailey at Colorado State. She looks at telomeres. Telomeres are the ends of your chromosomes, a special repeated sequence that starts off relatively long uh, in your life, and as you age or are understressed, tend to shrinken. Okay, so Susan already had a study going on where she was looking at astronauts and the, aspect, and the, and the effect of space flight on their telomere length in their white blood cells, and also the enzyme that controls the length, called telomerase. Okay, so she already had a pre-existing study and added Scott and Mark as subjects. Sticking with the DNA theme now, but going from the ends to the middle, we have Andy Feinberg at Johns Hopkins. He specializes in epigenetics, looking at modifications to the DNA molecule and the molecules that pack the DNA. Um, these slides, as well as the narrative, are oversimplifications. A lot of our investigators proposed overlapping aims, and what we've done is meld them all into one meta team, so that they are sharing samples, data, et cetera, all together so they can all meet their, their aims. Um, so, so Andy's looking at the epi epigenetics, which are part of the, the levers being used to regulate gene expression. So what genes are being activated uh, or repressed. So downstream from the, the DNA, we got RNA. So Chris Mason at Weill Cornell Medical College is looking at the RNA and its modifications, the epitranscriptome. So he's looking at what genes are actually produced and, and whether or not there are changes in, in things like the epitranscriptome. Uh, <clears throat> from the RNA, we go on to proteins and metabolites. Uh, Scott Smith with NASA at Johnson Space Center uh, is looking at proteins and metabolites. So in particular, Scott is tending to look at what we call targeted proteomics or metabolomics. So you have a choice in these investigations. Do you do the omics thing and look at a very broad range of molecules, proteins or metabolites? And if you do that, you're generally doing it at lower sensitivity. Or do you pick out a select few, or on the order of 50 in Scott's case, and look at those with more high sensitivity methods? So Scott is focusing primarily on targeted proteomics and, and metabolomics. Now here's one of my favorite studies. We're now going from the molecular to the sort of the cellular level. This is Emmanuel Mignot's work at Stanford. And he's looking at the immune system. So we know from our studies of our astronauts that we, say, we see changes in their immune system in space. Uh, a lot of the researchers like to call it dysfunction, like the immune system is being compromised in space. Okay? We know it is changing. We don't really know if it's a compromise because the astronauts are in a different environment than on Earth. I could have added to the stimulus list of things in addition to the weightlessness, radiation, and, and the isolation confined environment. The 
microbial environment that the astronauts are living in. First, we try and keep space station as clean as possible. There was experience with the Russian space station Mir of, of things growing in, in places behind panels, et cetera, that you know, we don't want. Um, so we, to a first order, we try and keep the station as clean as possible. Second, the food they eat is essentially sterile. It's, uh, it's stored and packaged you know, many months before they actually eat it. So it is a very microbially unchallenging food source and environment they live in. It makes sense that the immune system might stand down a little bit, and some of the things that we see are, are an appropriate accommodation to the environment. So Emmanuel's suggestion was, let's challenge Scott Kelly with a flu va vaccination in flight. <laughs> That's a pretty safe thing to do. He's not going to get the flu, um, and we'll see how he responds. So we actually got uh, you know, a flu shot before he went up in space to give us a baseline comparison, a shot when he was in space, and, and a shot um, like two weeks ago. Uh, just two weeks ago uh, was like the, one of the bit la last big uh, sample collections, and um, he got a flu shot at that time, and he'll have a, uh, probably had a follow-up last week. So Emmanuel's looking at the immune response and, and the repertoire of the immune system and how it's changing in response to that, that stimulus, that challenge. Okay, now moving from the cellular to the physiological, Stuart Lee, um, also at NASA Johnson um, uh, Space Center, is looking at me metabolomic and genomic markers of atherosclerosis. So he's looking at um, arterial walls and uh, their thickness and how they're responding to uh, pulsatile flow and correlating that with changes going on in the proteome and metabolome. So, uh, related to this, they're, they're, he's working very closely with Brenda Rana at um, UCSD. She's looking at proteomics in concert with the fluid shifts that we were talking about and, uh, and the vision problem, okay? So we, it's been very nice that we're able to, in the twin study, also use it to help attack understanding this, uh, this vision problem that we've been seeing. Okay, now moving from the physiology to cognition, Matthias Basner at Penn has a battery of 10 different tests that are run on a laptop computer. And they probe 10 different aspects of cognition in about 20 minutes' time, okay? And this is really important for us to have a tool like this at NASA because as our crew are going on long-duration missions, we need to know if we're working them too hard or not enough, et cetera. We need a way to monitor their um, state of, you know, cognitive state. Okay, so that's all. Uh, everything we've talked about so far are uh, involving Scott and Mark Kelly's cells, if you will. Um, the next part is the microbiome. So these are specifically the bacteria in the gut. So I was just reading, you know, for years we've been saying we are outnumbered on a cell count basis 10 to 1 by bacteria in our gut compared to us. Um, I was just reading that number might be closer to 1 to 1, it doesn't really matter. The point is the same. There are a lot of bacteria in our gut, on our skin, in our nose, et cetera. And there's increasingly, we're finding strong linkage, especially with the immune system. So Fred Turek at Northwestern University is look, looking at the um, GI tract and basically what comes out of the GI tract and characterizing what species are present in what abundance and whether or not they're changing over time. So again, back to Scott Kelly's diet in space and his environment, is he going to develop a new uh, composition of, of microbiota in his GI tract compared to Mark, who's eating a much wider variety of foods in different geographic locations, uh, et cetera. And then stitching it all together, we were ap delighted to have Mike Snyder, that we've, I've mentioned several times, uh, actually do two things. Um, one is he has his own uh, areas of interest where he's using the untargeted approach to look broadly at proteomics and metabolomics. But most importantly, he's got the in intellectual infrastructure, if you will, to tie all 10 of these investigations together and see if, for example, things we're seeing in the epigenome are correlating with change in 
changes in the immune system or cognition or, or what have you. Okay, so to put this all in one slide, Chris Mason, the transcriptome guy at, at uh, Cornell, put together this, this, uh, this chart. Um, so we start with our cell. We've kind of seen a picture like this before. We have the, the Kelly twins. And remember the term is peripheral blood mononuclear cells. I think Chris used special license here to, to add a new sense of the word peripheral here and taking a blood sample. But anyway, um, the types of uh, things we're investigating here are DNA mutations, um, modifications to the DNA molecule itself, the RNAs that are produced and modifications to them, uh, the proteins that are uh, expressed as a result. On the figure, we go back to chromatin, um, and that's the DNA packing and folding. Uh, and now back to proteins again, we're looking at antibodies uh, from the immune system, the distribution of B cells and T cells in the immune system, Susan Bailey's work on the, the telomeres, cytokines, we've got targeted and global metabolomics, we've got the microbiome, cognition, and vasculature. So all of these, all 10 of these labs are coming together and working as one unit. Um, it's really uh, remarkable and a great esprit de corps. To do this work on the molecular side, the samples are coming from the cheek um, and saliva, urine, blood, and stool. Uh, and then we have the physiological measures that go along with it, and then the computer measures. Okay, so the, the mission itself. Scott uh, launched on March 27th, 2015. Uh, there's a picture of his launch. Um, in flight, he uh, became a uh, really good photographer. He not only did selfies, but if you Google him, he did some wonderful uh, pictures of planet Earth and also space. I mean, he's, you know, you wouldn't think a... Uh, fighter pilot, you know, test pilot type would be such a, an artist, but the, he has just fantastic um, uh, photography. Um, in addition to doing a lot of experiments on himself uh, and conducting others for other scientists on the ground, uh, he did three EVAs uh, doing various space station maintenance things. Um, and then here's a, here's a funny picture. Here he is administering the flu shot to himself. Um, and his brother Mark... Uh, in the spirit of brotherly competition, when he saw this, he said, A, I have to give myself the flu shot, and B, it has to be photographed. You know. <laughs> I think he said the last part. I'm not sure about that, but he definitely wanted to do it himself so his brother couldn't have that one upmanship on him. Uh, Scott returned after 340 days, so just shy of the, the full year, um, on March 1st uh, of this year in good shape. Uh, since that time, uh, I've taken these off his own social media uh, pictures because i uh, got to be careful about you know, what I share. Uh, so here he is uh, having that um, part of the fluid shifts investigation and the, uh, he's having ultrasound measurements done and they're really going at him here. Uh, as you can see, the, the eye, the, the neck, and the, and the chest. Um, you might wonder why he's in this position. It's back to that fluid shifts uh, investigation. Uh, one way we mimic the effects of microgravity is to put people in head-down tilt positions. Um, that's one way to get that headward fluid shift. Um, so here we are in the timeline. Uh, back in 2012, the mission was announced. We released the solicitation, um, chose grants, and had just a few months to actually start the actual data collection. So depicted here in, in rough terms are major sampling sessions, a uh, circle if it's on the ground, triangle if it's in flight. Um, Scott, the flight subject's in blue. Mark is in green. We tried to match them up as closely as possible, but that wasn't always, didn't always work out with Mark's schedule. And here we are now. Um, just two weeks ago, uh, Scott had most of his last samples collected, got his flu shot, uh, had to come back a week later to, to have another set of blood samples. Um, but this is where we are in the investigation. Almost all the data is in hand. Um, there's one more round of telomere uh, samples to be collected, uh, but we're, we're almost uh, done with the, all the sample collection. So kind of recapping the progress to, to the moment, um, most of what we did in flight is pretty much what you would do in a terrestrial lab. 
with the exception of how we process the blood samples. Uh, we had to use some, tool, uh, some tubes that are available on Earth, but kind of in a different way than usual to help separate out components of the blood, um, basically the white blood cells from the, from the other cells. And uh, a key question we have for those that uh, work in the area is, so we have this large collection of white blood cells. Are we going to sort different cell types, CD4, CD8, CD19? Each time you do a cell sorting, you, you lose some cells uh, on the whole. And we don't have that much blood to work with. So this is something that the twins investigators have been adjusting roughly every six months as they get together and we meet and we talk about the experimental plan. Because as the cost of a lot of the assays is going down with time, they can plan new ways to do their analysis. Because one thing I haven't mentioned is a lot of these analyses are very sensitive and the results you get vary from batch to batch. So if you do a set of analyses today and do a set a week later on the same samples, you get slightly different results. And do it a month later, slightly different results because your reagents have changed a little bit, your instrument has changed a little bit. And so what the investigators are doing, all these samples we've taken are being banked and they'll be analyzed in parallel at the same time this calendar year. Um, so that's basically this, this point right here. So we have the cognition people, we have computer data, they got all their data. Telomeres has one more sample collection. And now we're really waiting on this batch processing of all the samples this year so that Mike Snyder and company can start the big integrated comprehensive analysis starting in January. Uh, if you're interested on how Scott's been recovering, um, again, check out the video tape of, of this lecture. You can, uh, you can try and Google him uh, or use, look up this URL. He um, met with, uh, came to NASA headquarters and spoke for almost an hour about his uh, uh, experience with the one-year mission and his recovery. And I've just kind of in bulletized form summarized some of the, his personal experience because he, he flew before this mission. He flew, um, I think it was a, it was a four to five month mission. So he, so he's in a good position to compare his first flight, I think was three days, his second 17 days. Um, next one I think was about 150 and then this one at 340. So uh, he experienced on his return to Earth, uh, joint pain and muscle soreness and fatigue. All of these are things he's seen before, but they were more intense for him uh, this time. The sore feet is interesting. He hasn't mentioned this specifically, but a lot of astronauts talk about it. We all have calluses on the bottom of our feet. When you go into weightlessness, you're not walking on anything, okay? You lose those calluses. But if you look carefully at some of the pictures of astronauts doing work on station, they have their feet um, slipped under like little loops uh, of you know, fabric or, or, or something and to keep them from floating off while they do their work. They actually develop calluses on top of their feet. Um, so when they first come back after a long mission, they're, they're, the bottom of their feet are sore for a good bit. And that was particularly true for um, Scott. He also complained uh, about sensitive skin. Um, in weightlessness, he just had the, you know, the mild contact of clothing for a year. When he came back, sitting for a prolonged period, laying down, he would get a burning sensation in his skin. And that took quite a while to abate. He got some rashes, et cetera. Um, he had some flu-like symptoms, which he didn't elaborate on, but it was probably the space motion sickness readaptation. And he mentioned, hey, if I hadn't done this before, I'd probably go to the emergency room. But, you know, been there, done that, he knew that some of these symptoms were, um, were familiar ones. So before, when he flew for... Uh, four or five months. It took him about six months to completely recover. Uh, he thinks that the rate he's been going, um, it's going to take him more than the six months to recover from the one-year mission. But um, we'll see. And uh, this is interesting information to have. It's kind of anecdotal, but it's interesting to augment that uh, with the, the scientific uh, studies. Okay, other progress, Scott. Uh, this is for Scott, you know, his personal life that he's posted. He missed his regular six-month checkup, so he's been catching up on things like that. Okay, one last topic here. Um, this has been a pioneering investigation for NASA in a couple of respects. One is the, the scientific aspect and 
our first foray into 21st century omics. Um, we have not done any study like this before. And uh, it turns out with our going from the molecular level up to cognition, we're not aware even today of any other study that has spanned such a vertical range of biological organization from the molecular you know, up to cognition. But it's also been a real pathfinder on the ethical front. Uh, as a society, there are several issues that we're dealing with as we get more powerful biomedical tools and more knowledge uh, that goes along with it so that as it becomes easier to sequence our DNA, we can actually make stronger inferences about our health outcomes at the same time. Layered on top of those are issues that are specific to the astronauts. So in general, when you're talking about genomic research, the primary risks are not physical well-being. There are risks of social and psychological harm. Uh, you can generate anxiety and confusion about what your disease risk is. You know, you can, um, some people will be very depressed by the fact that they might be at risk for a particular malady. It turns out, independent of socioeconomic status, that when a lot of these wide genome studies are done, 5 to 10% of the population learns something surprising about their ancestry. You know, could be as innocuous as, you know, in the distant past, there's kind of blood from some other part of the planet that they didn't anticipate, or it could be a little bit more immediate, like, you know, who their parents or siblings are. Uh, so that's a risk in these kinds of studies. Uh, genomic information is really difficult to de-identify. You know, if we just have our blood pressure measurements out there, we can't trace it to anyone in this room. But, you know, given a sequence with the right, it, it turns out oftentimes you can find out who that person is. Um, so that's a challenge. And that's particularly a challenge because our astronauts are public figures. Here's a ticker tape parade picture, Alan Shepard coming back from the first space flight. There are people out there that stalk our astronauts. There's an individual out there that when an astronaut dies, they request medical records of that astronaut because they're no longer covered by privacy uh, law after they die. So our astronauts are particularly at risk for people poking around and, and circulating conclusions or conjectures about their health or the health of their siblings or their offspring or their parents. Um, there's a question of what information do subjects want to or should they receive? Uh, do you give them the sequence data? You know, to a non-expert, what are you going to do with that? Um, do you give them an interpretation of it? Do you hook them up with a genetic counselor? And that's basically what we've chosen to do with the Kelly brothers, is they have had genetic counseling throughout this whole process and will continue to do so. Um, generally in research, you try and make the data available to as many people as possible, but with our astronaut data, that's a bit of a, um, a challenge for the privacy reasons we were talking about just a second ago. Um, so we're working on that. So we... Uh, it's amazing when you work in the government um, and it's always a challenge to get things done through the system. It's amazing what happens when you have a launch date in front of you, which is not going to move. So in just two months' time, we were able to put in place an interim genetic research policy uh, for the Kelly twins. And those are like unheard of. Um, it errs on the side of caution. We use genetic counseling as much as possible to keep them informed and they have the ability to look at all presentation material and publication, manuscripts, uh, before they, are, they, they go outside of NASA, basically, or our investigator team, uh, to screen them for things that they think might be too sensitive and need, need to be redacted. Um, there are other issues we won't go into, like how to, how to use this information to tailor their medical care. Um, there are societal issues. You know, health insurance is not a problem, but this genomic information could be used as people try and get disability or life insurance. Um, and the last bullet here, employment activity, uh, is, is another factor, particularly for the astronauts. If an astronaut has a particular condition or may have a condition, um, how will that be used or not to factor into their, how well they fit into a particular mission? Um, the basic rule of thumb is we're not using genetic information to you know, assign duties and whatnot. But, um, having said that, as you understand what countermeasures an individual astronaut might need, that may change what, what missions are well-suited for them. 
Okay, so to conclude, Mars is the horizon destination for the human spaceflight program. And that's broadly accepted in our government and our international partners. Um, spaceflight induces many changes to the human system, and we're getting a good handle on those, but still having some surprises like the Vision one. The twin study is bringing, for the first time for us, a molecular understanding of omics to bear on the effects of spaceflight, um, as well as these higher order uh, effects. And, and lastly, in order to do this study, we've also had to overcome some ethical challenges and get some policy in place. Um, so a couple of thanks are in order. Uh, this is the uh, first meeting of the investigator team and HRP and NSBRI. Sorry, that I tried not to talk acronyms, but NASA management uh, types who helped make the study possible. Uh, of course, we have to thank the, the Kelly brothers for being participants in this study. Uh, even though Scott is a, was an astronaut, he's retired now, uh, in standard practice, you know, he didn't have to sign up for any of these studies, but, um, but he did, as did Mark. And lastly, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So we, we have time for some questions, and there's a procedure for the questions. And the first part of the procedure is that you have to raise your hand long enough for one of our microphone carriers to know that you want to ask a question. Keep it up, and they will eventually bring a microphone to you. And when you have the microphone, we ask that you stand up, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member or you're a guest. If you're a guest, sit down. You can't ask a question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, no, no harm in being a guest. We love to have guests, and we just like to know. And ask a question. Please don't make a speech. And with that, uh, would you raise your hand if you have a question? So we have Carl and then um, Jay. Jay. So let's say Carl first and then Jay, and then we have a question back here. Who had their hand up over there? Uh, Laura. Uh, Carl Merrill, a member of the society. <clears throat> Two questions. One is um, the heavy radiation that they get, the cosmic rays, some of it, as you pointed out, is iron. Some of that iron is iron-60, so it's radioactive in and of itself. And so that's going to have long-term effects, and I, I don't know how you study that. But the, real, the other question I have is when you collect the, the samples of the microbiome, um, how do you store them so that they are going to be equivalent when they get back? And Because and, some of those organisms don't do well under storage, so I'm not sure how you can do that sort of study unless you do it out in space there. Yeah, well, we, uh, of course, thanks for the questions, Carl. Uh, of course, we, we uh, store the microbiome samples very carefully. Um, so that's stool samples, um, uh, a favorite of all fifth graders. Uh, we have on the International Space Station uh, a freezer we call the Melfi. It stands for minus 80. Uh, minus 80 laboratory, I, I don't know what the whole uh, acronym is. But, but basically, um, a swab is taken of the stool and put in a tube packaging and then placed in the freezer. We are not, the type of analyses that will be done are not requiring us to uh, reculture any of the bacteria. Uh, this is actually one of the areas where the strategy for analysis is changing as our costs of analysis are, are dropping. Um, what will be done is, uh, almost certainly, is what's called shotgun sequencing, where they'll sequence all the DNA that's present, whether the organisms are alive or not, to start with, won't matter. Um, so the nice thing about shotgun sequencing is they'll get bacteria, which is the main thing of interest, but also fungi, protozoa, viruses, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then to the iron 60 question, uh, the short, the, the concise answer is, I don't know. Um, my guess would be uh, that, you know, it's in low abundance, and so it's probably not a major contributor. Um, as it turns out, in a space station uh, mission or in deep space, uh, you know, a heavy ion is, is going to hit uh, a cell nucleus, um, you know, every couple weeks. And so only a small fraction of those will be iron, and a smaller fraction of those will be the iron 60. So my guess is it would be a small effect, but I really don't know. Jay? I'm Dale Doucette. I'm a member. Um, I'm also uh, a retired Air Force scientist. 
And um, my questions are very different from what you're going to get for everybody else here. Um, for years, we, um, we looked at the effect uh, of flight on individuals in their career. Um, and we found that uh, the pilots and the people that are having to do with flight strongly supported that against automated kind of activities. Uh, and they developed a strong prejudice and divide between those cultures. Uh, I sense somewhat that in NASA. And uh, how much of NASA's efforts are going into automated so that we don't have to send people out there? So probes that go out that can do everything that a human can. As a matter of fact, what we discovered in the Air Force is that when we send these things out, they can do more than men can. So uh, I would like to have you discuss that. All right, thank you, Dale. Um, so NASA in its organizational structure, it has the science mission directorate, which does like the, the planetary science, the Mars rovers, et cetera. And so that section of NASA is trying to obtain as much scientific information as it can without the use of humans. Um, then we have the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, which from the very you know, name involves the human to start with. So that's a, a different track, and everything I've described today is part of that, that human effort. Uh, I don't think NASA views it as an either-or proposition. It's a both-and uh, proposition. We would like as much as possible to use robotics in conjunction with humans. So this is just looking forward and it's just, just Craig's forecast or imagination. Uh, I think it's very likely when we explore Mars uh, as, as hum with humans present, it will be as probably as part of a robotic swarm. Um, because in the way we currently think about Mars, we have what are called special regions, which are regions where we think that life as we know it has a chance of existing. Um, you know, temperature, um, protection from radiation, uh, water. Uh, there are other regions which seem, from an Earth life perspective, um, sterile. Um, and so we want to be very careful as we explore going into um, special, special regions. Uh, a way, good way to do that would be humans venturing close, but in concert with robotic assistants, as it were, that were you know, measuring things to get ground truth, so to speak, about exactly where they were you know, exploring. So I think in future, it'll be very likely to be both. Um, there are some people who uh, would say we should just never send humans, we should do, all do it robotically. Um, there are others that would say it is, uh, you could try and do that, but it is part of the human spirit to explore. You know, we are on every continent on the planet because as a species, that's what we do. And it wouldn't be the same if we only sent robots up to the top of Mount Everest and say, yeah, we've climbed Mount Everest or we've gone to the South Pole. It's, uh, it's just qualitatively different in the human experience. Um, so I would say, in short, the NASA approach is not either or but both and. Or Sorry. I'm Laura Jones. I'm a guest. My question is pretty simple. A lot of interesting studies, obviously, that they're doing. They just finished data collection. When can we expect to see those kind of results published? Next year. Um, is the, you know how, uh, based on our earlier conversation, it, it can take a while. M Mike Snyder hopefully will have all the data from the nine other labs uh, in January. And then the, the plan is for the, the team to publish one seminal paper together um, with the overarching conclusions of the study. Then possibly, uh, it, it depends on what, what we find um, and depending on what journal it's, it's published in, 
There might be in parallel in the same journal or journal family uh, uh, accompanying articles that go into more depth into each uh, area. Beyond that, the labs are uh, free to publish as much as they want together. But that first seminal paper, we're hoping we can get out in 2017, but you know, it's gonna take months for the initial analysis and then it takes months for publication. So um, it won't be in time for Christmas, Laura, I'm sorry. So I think I have a question in the back there, yeah. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Jess. Uh, so I know this study had to do with uh, the difference between one brother staying on Earth and one brother being in, uh, in, in the space station for a whole year. Um, my question is, um, <clears throat> how will this data collection and the difference help with, say, someone being in a space station as opposed to your efforts on Mars, where you know, it, the collection of data between, say, a brother on Earth and a brother on Mars? Uh, I'm just wondering how that will how this study will ha help advance those efforts that you explore to do in Mars in the next 20 to 30 years? So if we, if we had Scott alone, um, you know, I showed that one cartoon graph of how things changed. Um, as we see changes just in Scott alone, it would be hard to tell just with Scott alone how much how that stacked up against normal variation over the course of the year in very different environments. So by having the two together, we have a better measure of what our significant changes. Um, now, to take the flu shot, for example, um, and, and, you know, and the Mars mission, um, it, it's an open question. We, we are definitely seeing changes in the immune system. Is, it, is, the, is the immune system winding down in an unhealthy manner, or is it accommodating in a proper way to the environment? By challenging Scott on this mission for about midway in his mission, we'll have a good idea, at least for that time frame, whether or not his immune system is being compromised or not. Um, so that's just one example, and it's not the final answer. I mean, the, the Mars mission, it's a six month transit, you know, time on the planet back. There are more studies to be done, but it's, uh, as we increase duration, we see how the human physiology is changing, how it's adapting, and like the plasma volume is a good story, with, along with the red blood cell production. If you only had space shuttle data, you might be concerned that for some unknown reason, we are no longer able to make new red blood cells, and long-term space travel would be not an option. Um, but instead what we see, by going to the space station duration, we're coming to a new homeostatic point. Um, so all of these, as we increase duration, we get a better idea of how a 30-month mission to Mars and back, how we would fare. Oh, and you're next. I didn't realize. Okay. No, no, you, first, and then you. Thank you. Hi. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for coming to speak today. My name is Oscar Weigel. I, I'm a guest from the NIST Center for Neutron Research. And uh, I was just really curious. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. A lot of questions, uh, but I really wanted to know how much of Mr. Snyder's work was repeated, how much of it overlapped with the data that you acquired from Scott and his brother. There are a lot of commonalities um, in the, uh, like the focus on the white blood cells, for example, and that's all that Mike Snyder included in, in that paper. Um, with our twin study, we've added, you know, cheek and saliva um, and more uh, the, the microbiome work, et cetera. Now it actually, so the twin study expanded a lot uh, on what Mike did. Having said that, Mike's an interesting character. He, he's still doing a study on himself. He, he hasn't stopped measuring himself. And, uh, and he does all kinds of crazy things. Like I, it was back in January or February, I was having lunch with him and he orders four glasses of water, please, to go with the lunch. Uh, room temperature, you know, no ice. Okay, what's this? So gets his glass of water, pulls out of his pocket. Um, he's got some fiber. And he sprinkles this fiber, you know, and he needs four glasses worth because it's not very soluble. And, and so this is all part of his study where he's, he's adjusting his microbiome with different fibers, you know, from time to time. So, um, so eventually Mike might, you know, do everything on himself. But uh, certainly the twin study was a big, you know, expansion. And, and Mike has not been doing anything like the cognition. 
I think there's, you have a microphone? Yeah. Uh, my name is Bruce Murray. I'm a, a guest. Um, I was thinking about the brother, uh, Mark, who has undergone probably quite a few stresses of his own with the situation with his wife, Gabby Giffords. Um, had things pretty well stabilized with her by the time this study took place, so that, that, that the kind of stress that he must have been experiencing with that uh, might have you know, kind of temp tempered down a little bit? Yeah, I have no specific knowledge of that. It's a good question, but I, I don't have any info. Just stand up, it's on. David Rosen, member. Uh, it, it was pretty hard to find t uh, identical human twins who would be willing to go through this experiment. Have you tried doing it with uh, an non-human animals? It must be easier to find because you have because they have no choice to choose a do a two twin dogs or even triplets, you know. So. Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting point because a lot of uh, scientific research done, like on mice, you know, for cancer research is using specific strains. So they are, in some sense, all twins. In fact, Fred Turek, the guy doing the microbiome uh, study, uh, has, since starting this study, got separate funding from NASA to do um, uh, a study on mice and their circadian rhythm in, in space. And because they're all the same strain, and because Mark Kelly, I'm trying to remember the details now, Mark Kelly has helped, like co-authored a children's book uh, that is about a mouse astronaut. Um, and so Fred was trying to make this connection of, okay, now we got the twin mouse astronauts flying, you know, for his investigation. So, um, so to answer your question, yeah, a lot of scientific studies essentially are using twins when we're talking about uh, model organisms like mice. And, and that's been pointed out that, you know, a lot of times the strains behave very differently and, and the conclusions you make on one strain don't apply to another. And, so it's actually, in some ways, it gives you more power in an investigation, but you lose some of the robustness in the conclusion because sometimes it doesn't carry over to a different set of twins, if you will. Is there a question in the back there? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Renee Willems, I'm a guest. Um, you've addressed uh, physiological issues, psychological issues, social issues, including the monotony. One way of breaking the monotony is acting upon the human libido. Sending a, a team of six people up in space for 30 months is a long time. Um, if you don't act upon the libido, that might cause physiological changes, maybe social changes, social tension. Not acting upon it might do the same thing. Has this been addressed at all? Not yet. <laughs> we are not, not funding any work in that area just yet, but it's an excellent question. And uh, <laughs> in the back there, yeah. That, so yeah, that, you know, that's a big question going forward. What should be the composition of the crew? You know, should it be, you know, all female, all male, a mixture, married, unmarried? These are. I think the reality is these are difficult questions. They can invite all kinds of interesting scrutiny. And so we keep, uh, not keep, but we're just haven't got, we're not addressing it yet because it's not an imminent need. And um, yeah. There's a question in the back there. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is James. I'm a guest. Um, I was wondering, moving forward and seeing the price of genetic analysis dropping so rapidly, do you foresee um, this kind of genetic testing becoming uh, like routine in the future for to increase the number of statistics. So like, were the experiments that he had to undergo, like did they take away from his other scientific responsibilities that they became difficult to do or could it be something that is done for all astronauts and then you have a large, larger data set in the future? Yeah, so we are uh, working on making these kinds of molecular analyses more standard practice um, uh, with our astronauts so that we uh, especially 
since space station right now is slated to go until 2024, so you know there's a finite number of subjects you know in future, and so there's discussion about what do we need to, what samples do we need to collect now and bank because, in addition to the cost dropping, the power is increasing. So if you were to collect samples right now and use all the material and analyze it, well, five years from now there might be a whole new category of measurement possible, and you have no material. So. These are things that we talk about. Um, I thought the first part was the first part of your question about the society at large, or is it just all about the astronauts? No, just the astronauts. Yeah. There's a question in the back. Uh, my name is Jorge. I'm a guest. Similarly to the cost of sequencing DNA, do you have numbers of the cost of putting humans? Uh, out of space, like is it dropping in the same um, proportion as the, the cost of launching humans to space? Yeah, uh, it is not dropping like Moore's law, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, uh, NASA has been cultivating for several years now uh, the commercial space industry for human spaceflight. Um, an analogy is made to. Uh, the support of the aviation industry, I think it was in the 20s, uh, with airmail. So there were a number of aviation companies that sprung up uh, around the, the 20s, but there wasn't uh, a stable and broad enough demand for air travel that they were springing up and, and failing. And the government let out some contracts to, um, to carry the mail and, and created airmail. And that provided a stable enough business environment for companies to actually um, kind of cross some threshold and, and get into the passenger service, et cetera, uh, in, a, in, a, in a robust way. Similarly, right now, NASA started with uh, letting out some contracts to commercial companies for resupplying the space station with supplies. Um, and it has also let out contracts for um, human transportation, okay? So um, SpaceX and Orbital are supplying uh, the space station with supplies right now, and SpaceX and um, Boeing have contracts to look at um, ferrying crew uh, in future. So the, the hope is that moving from government-led transportation to commercial-led uh, will help drop the cost. But unfortunately, there's not a Moore's Law type of thing going on where we're you know, having the cost every 18 months. But the, the hope is to drive it down. And a lot of the costs in spaceflight have to do with infrastructure on the ground. So if you can get a large enough business space and high enough flight rates, you can, without a change in technology, you can drop um, costs. Um, I have one last question there. Mm. Uh, hi, I'm Andy. I'm a guest. I was just wondering, uh, to what extent do you partner with, I guess, other, other federal agencies like NIH or HHS that also do research in the life sciences so that your efforts complement each other and that so federal money is spent in a particular way that, that reinforces uh, your priorities? Yeah, we're, we're always looking for areas to do that, especially from a NASA perspective. Um, you know, we are relatively small players when it comes to life sciences research. Um, so whereas like the NIH, you know, has a $30 billion budget. So one area where we've teamed with the NIH, uh, and, it, and it goes both ways, is um, we have a facility up at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island. Uh, so that's a DOE facility. But we have a facility within it called the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory, NSRL. And there we use the DOE beam line to, to work our own particle physics magic and provide um, particle beams from protons up to iron. Um, so we can simulate galactic cosmic rays, okay? Now, we do it because we're trying to understand the biological effects of GCR. But we've been talking with the National Cancer Institute um, because, uh, like I said before, most radiation therapy is with photons. Um, in this country, you can also find proton therapy. Um, in Germany and Japan, you can find carbon therapy. Now, with protons and especially with carbon, what happens is um, as, as the particles are going through tissue, 
They're depositing energy, and because they're moving so fast, they're such high energy, there's not much time to interact, and they don't deposit much energy. But as they slow down, they deposit more and more. And what actually happens is, it's a, like a virtuous cycle. As they slow down, they deposit more and more. What happens is that there's a big absorption peak called the Bragg peak. So whereas with X-rays or, or gamma rays, if you looked at energy deposited with distance, it goes like this. So if you're trying to get a tumor inside the body, um, you're, you're going through a lot of cells and depositing a lot of energy before you get to the tumor. With a Bragg peak from a particle beam, protons, carbon, whatever, um, you can deposit most of that energy at the tumor. Okay, so, so NCI is interested in using our um, facility to do some preclinical work to explore, you know, at a basic level, um, more of the effects of this, this approach for, for therapy. Um, but, we, but we've had those, and why, did, why do they want to use our facility or how they even know about it? Because we've been having them on our advisory panels and helping them, uh, they have been helping us uh, you know, with the research, guiding the research. And a lot of our investigators are funded by the NIH as well. So, you know, um, so we're really kind of tapping the talent pool that the NIH has created. That's the just one last question. Lloyd? Okay, Lu <clears throat> Lloyd Mitchell, I'm a member. Uh, I have a quick, simple one and a little more complicated question. The first is, since you have identical twins, how do you know which one really flew? <laughs> and the second one is, you're basically doing an environmental study, and since both of them were astronauts, they've both been exposed to space. So are you looking at any pre-flight samples? Do you have samples from the astronauts before they ever flew? And are they going to be included in the study? Yeah, there, um, we have very little in the way of samples before they ever flew. Um, in this study, uh, we, we took samples six months before launch and three months before launch. Um, but if you're talking about before they even took their first space flight, we have some forensic samples, so samples that were collected to allow in forensic identification if there was a mishap uh, uh, later, but we don't have you know, an extensive uh, bank. Um, and as to the first question, we'll, we'll leave it as an exercise for the audience <laughs> to figure out. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Before you go, I'd like to present you with a small token of thanks for coming here and spending time with us and giving this lecture, a framed uh, and uh, signed copy of the announcement of your talk on behalf of the uh, membership and the general committee. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Society, for inviting me for this opportunity. And thank you, audience. So before we go, there's a few uh, closing remarks. Uh, PSW depends on an enthusiastic, active, and capable membership. Without these, no PSW, no free lectures, no free refreshments. So if you're not a member, uh, please consider joining. It's pretty easy. You can just go to the website, www.psw.org pswscience.org. Uh, there's a uh, link to the membership application page, and you'll be a member in pretty quick order. So before you leave tonight, there's a person in the back, the big bouncer, and he will make sure that you sign up. If you're, how many of you are Meetup members? Okay, a few. Well, just so you know, which you probably already know, being a member of Meetup is not the same as being a member of PSW, and we encourage you to join PSW as well as be a member of the Meetup group. Uh, please see membership chairman James Hewen or corresponding secretary Robin Taylor. If you have any questions about membership or uh, giving us money, uh, remember that PSW is a nonprofit educational organization tax exempt under Section 501c3 of our beloved Internal Revenue Code, and contributions are tax deductible. Our next lecture. It's the one in red, uh, will be the 2,365th meeting of the society. Uh, it, the speaker will be Carrie Lease, Principal Staff Scientist, Planetary Exploration Group Applied Physics Laboratory at the Johns Hopkins University. He'll be speaking on prospects for life and human habitability around nearby stars. The punchline, he thinks, 
will find many habitable worlds, but the life they harbor will be microbial. And we look forward to, morning, to learning more about the basis for this prediction. The fall schedule has been posted to the website. Please check there at regular intervals for updates to the schedule. The social hour ends at 10.30, after which PSW members and their guests meet at the Fairfax Hotel Lounge just across Massachusetts Avenue. If you want to join us there and you're not sure how to get there, please ask Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor or Vice President Lloyd Mitchell, and they'll be happy to show you how to get there. Otherwise, please use the side entrances to exit the building, and I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the meeting to the social hour. Second? All in favor? All opposed? The meeting is adjourned.